Hey, good morning, everyone. And good morning to our students online as well. Okay, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Let's submit this hour, submit this day into God's hands. Uh, let's just pray that God will minister to us even as we continue to learn throughout the course of this day. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, for this morning, Lord. We thank you for your grace, oh God. We are here not because of our own abilities. We are here because your grace and your mercy abounds in our lives. And Lord, even as we come together to study about our identity and what you have called us to be, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak to each of our hearts, minister to us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that everything we learn, we will apply it and walk in this identity that you have called us in, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. So uh, last week we did quite a lot, last class. Uh, we talked about how God has redeemed us from the fear of death. God has redeemed us from generational bondages, right? Uh, one of the questions that came up was, if there's a generational bondage from years, right, uh, will it still work in my family? Definitely not, because as a believer, when we be believe in Jesus, we are free from that bondage, right? Then we also talked about the blood of Jesus, the importance of the blood of Jesus. You know, we always pray it, we speak it, uh, and we saw that, you know, the blood of Jesus testifies for what is being done right now. Right? The blood of Jesus, everyone say testifies. That means it's like a testimony. The blood of Jesus is like, in the book of Hebrews, it says that the Lord Jesus took his own blood as a testimony. Right? So, then we also looked at, we are free from the bondage of the law. Now, in the Old Testament, the law was given. What did the law do? Still kept them into bondage. They were not in freedom. right? But now, through the cross, we find freedom. And also, we talked about free from meaningless rituals. What is rituals? Something that has passed on from generation to generation to generation is a ritual. Right? For example, why you go to church on Sunday? I don't know. My parents go. That means what? Sometimes we hear the word ritual and we think of other faiths. No. Oh. Judaism, you look at the Old Testament. It was a ritual. Right? Just go do, okay, sacrifice, go back, sin, come back, sacrifice. It became a ritual. There was no meaning in it. When God told Moses to do it, you know, you come up with these offerings. There was some meaning. But over time, for the Israelites, it became meaningless. Ritual. What is today? Passover. What is tomorrow? One more feast. What is next month? One more feast. That's all it was. Right? There was no meaning in it. But through the cross, you and I are free from rituals. That means what? It's not like we have to go to a place, close the door, only then we can pray to Jesus. Or it's not like only on Sunday in the church we can experience God's presence. No. Right? We're free from all of that. It's, it's no more a ritual. We can be doing anything, cooking. We can experience God. We can God can minister to us. Right? So those that mindset of oh, I have to wait for Sunday to speak to Jesus, those are all meaningless rituals but we, we don't have to live by free from okay let's get into chapter 75 we start from here right yes okay free from man-made ideas now there's a lot of man-made ideas right when you look at us you look at things around us are there ideas man-made ideas plenty right now let's look at how you and I are free from these man-made ideas. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, 16 to 23. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. 
Let no one cheat you for your reward, taking delight and false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Verse 20, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but of no but of are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Now, Paul is writing this whole passage. It, it sounds a little bit confusing, but basically what he's saying is some people are taking pride by saying, Hey, I, I did these. Following, you know, following all the festivals, I followed all the laws. You know, I did. I gave my best sacrifice to God, and I, you know, I, I fasted and prayed for forty days. I did everything. Now Paul is saying here. He's saying, it is the wisdom of God, right? God gives us the wisdom to follow the rules and uh, regulations and things that are their offerings on all of it. But people are boasting about that. Saying, I did this, 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 this. So Paul is reminding them, hey, you are coming. That means you're coming to God's presence by all that you did. You're coming to Jesus by all the sacrifices and all these works that you have done. Paul is saying, all of these will only bring pride. Here he says in verse, uh, in the verse he says, for humility, he talks about humility, right? Uh, in verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility. That means what? What is false humility? There's a difference between humility and false humility. Humility is walking in humbleness, right? False humility is what? Pretending to be humble, but really you're not humble, right? And so the people there, Paul is writing and he's saying, you all are pretending to be humble by doing all these things. But in reality, you're boasting about what you have done. So Paul is saying, don't go by these ideas. Don't go by what men have you know, set these regulations. Don't go by only that. Now, there are certain regulations and rules that we must follow, right? So for example, we have decided Sunday will be a uh, services church services right now it was a man made idea right over time from saturday we moved it to sunday for practical idea practical reasons now is it working is it beneficial for us to have service on sunday yes right but it's not like you know we're not there are some ideas which you know dist or destruct the word of God or twist the word of God. Right? Now, some ideas, it's good. Right? So, for example, some churches have communion in the beginning of the service. Some churches have in the middle. Some services have it in the end. Some have, especially in North India, when you go, you have praise and worship, then announcements, then you have worship songs. Now, first praise songs, then announcements, then worship songs. Right. Now, these are all man-made ideas, but it's not wrong. Right? It's, not, it's not that they're glorifying themselves. It's just to make sure that the service happens right. So here Paul is saying, no, he's not talking about this planning and execution. He's talking about your personal life. Don't follow things just because others are doing, you don't do it. Follow what the Word of God says. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Look at this. Now imagine, this is Paul. Is he a Jew? Is Paul a Jew? 
So he's a learned man, right? He knew everything about the law. Now he's saying, don't give heed to Jewish fables. That means don't give heed, don't uh, you know, keep following all these traditions and man-made ideas. What are some of the man-made ideas? I'm just giving a few examples, right? For example, right, uh, if you look at a few things, uh, not really in ministry, but I'm saying, okay, so for example, in the Jewish custom, some of the man-made ideas could be, you know, when you get your sacrifice, make sure you stand there and you should stand for 10 minutes. And you cannot enter through this gate. You must only enter through. All these are, you know, I'm just giving an example, right? But all these are man-made ideas. Thinking that, okay, if I do it like this, then it'll work. So Paul is saying, these are Jewish fables and commandments which bring nothing. What do they do? More than turning to God, we turn away from God with all this. Right? So we do not be, look at this verse in the next portion there in your notes. It says festivals, new moons and Sabbaths. We do not have to be subject to man-made ideas on observing days. Right now, for example, it's written there Lent. If you look at the Roman Catholic Church, now nothing against it. Right, there's nothing against doing it, but these Lent is a 40 days where they, you know, they stay away from meat, right? They don't eat meat, they don't indulge in meat. Now, it was just it's just to honor God, to it's like a sacrifice, like how you and I do fasting, right? But it's a man made idea, right? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong, we can we can, we can you know fast and sacrifice you know go through a time a season of you know sacrificing food but it's not like without that god won't work you get what i'm saying right it's not like if i don't do this don't follow these days then god won't work no you may have heard preachers and pastors saying if you don't do like this then god judgment will come upon you and if you don't pray if you don't do this god will do this now be careful with all those prophecies, right? Think about it. Is God, does God work like that? If I don't fast and pray 40 days, God will, you know, he will never uh, give me a job or he will never uh, put me in the ministry. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't look at works. He looks at the calling. He looks at what is inside us, right? then we do not subject ourselves to somebody else's spiritual encounters that means some other person had visions and dreams and angels and jesus and you know nowadays when you look at youtube you have all kinds of people have you seen the the, the testimonies right i'm not saying they're not true they may be true right some of them have gone with gone met jesus had tea with jesus they've come back Right. Some of them have gone to hell. They said hi to a few demons. They came back. So all of this is, it could be, right? Angelic visitations, all of that is good. But we don't base our, our identity out of all of that. Meaning we don't subject ourselves, hey, this person went to heaven and came, so he will know everything. Right? Or he saw angels. Or he saw, you know, visions and dreams. Uh, you don't have to subject yourself. There's a testimony. Okay, take it. Move on. Right? But what we see right now is people get so engrossed in this, you know, angels, dreams, visions. It's good. The supernatural is good. But don't, don't you know, follow somebody because they're in the supernatural. You pursue God. You ask God to minister to you. He can't take you to heaven. Can he take you to heaven? He went to heaven and came. But can he take you? Who can take you to heaven? Jesus. Can he pray on behalf of you to take you to heaven? This boy is a good boy. Can he just, he also wants to see heaven. Can he do, can he do that? No. So basically, don't depend or don't put your entire identity on someone else's spiritual encounters ask god for your own right lord you speak to me okay then there are cultural superstitions uh, which especially in our nation nation of india we have a nation of culture right 
we, we come from different uh, cultures, different backgrounds. We all have many, many man-made rules and man-made superstitions. But here's the thing. If these rules and these things that we follow are taking us away from God, then we got to be careful. Right? Now, let me give you this example. If the church says, you know, women should cover their hair while praying, and I'm sure in the churches in North India they do that. Now, is it, it it's a, it's a man-made, um, what do you call it? It's a man-made rule, right? Over time they've made it. But does it take them away from God? It doesn't. So cover the hair, cover. No, no big deal. But if a person comes and says, if you don't cover your hair, Holy Spirit won't come. Holy Spirit won't minister to you because you are unholy. Now, what is that? You know that that is wrong. You know that that's not how God works. Right? So you're understanding what I'm saying. Right? So these man-made rules should not take us away from God, should not bring condemnation or fear. Right? Then it's wrong. And we can just throw it away. Right? Because we are free from all of that. 76, chapter 76. Stand firm in your freedom. The Bible says, no, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is firm? What's the word firm? What does the word firm mean? Firm means... Uh, you see a, a tree which is maybe the tree outside there. Can you go shake it and break it? You can't because it's it's firm, it's established. It may be maybe 100 years old, that tree. You can't. So that's being firm. Right? If you have to take out that tree, you will need a, a person to come with, you know, a, a saw and all of these electronic equipment to cut it down so firm even a storm may not take it off As paul is saying here stand firm in the liberty that means you be strong in the liberty that christ has given you so the devil will come and say you have you are in bondage you did this you did this you stand firm because you say hey christ has set me free it says here and do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage. You know what does entangled mean? See all these wires here, right? What happens when the wires go crisscross? Right? They get entangled, and you won't know which wire is for what. Right? So that's why it's very important to lay out the wires so they don't get entangled. So Paul is saying, don't en get entangled by the yoke of bondage. They are there, but don't get entangled with it. The enemy is there. He's trying to trap you. You don't get entangled in it because Christ has set you free. Right? Has he set you free? Yes. Right? So you walk in that freedom. Right? Now, if you, you know, I, I got this wonderful opportunity once to talk to an old man, and he was born before the independence. This happened quite some time back. And I was talking to him, and he was a very older man. So I asked him, how was it before independence? Oh, before independence, it was, it was good and it was bad. He was saying, the good thing was, you know, the Britishers came, they brought a lot of their, you know, culture of, uh, you know, the things that they do. They helped us learn a lot of things. They brought uh, education, right? So most of the schools in, in for example, Bangalore, many of them were started 19... 14, 18, whatever, you know, 1800s. Why? Because they came, they, uh, you know, they did a lot of work. Now, he was saying that there was this freedom, but there was also this feeling that this is not my, my land. Now, the Britishers gave them freedom. Okay, you want to start hospital? Start. If you want to start school? Start. Right? It was not like the Indians were put under suppression continuously. No. It's just that they were governing. But there was this feeling of, I am subject 
to the Britishers. I don't belong in my own country. They had the freedom, you know, to start and do whatever they want to do. But they felt inside that I am being a slave because I'm, I'm ruled by another government. Right? So that's not how it is now. You and I, the enemy may come and say, you know, you did these things wrong. These are the bondages in your life. You say, hey, I'm set free. Right? I'm, I'll stand firm in my freedom. Look at the next one, chapter 77. Do not misuse your freedom. Everyone say misuse. What is misuse? To wrongly use freedom. Let's look at this verse. Galatians chapter 5, 13 and 14. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look at that. Paul is being quite stern now. right? He's saying, you have been called to freedom. You've been called to liberty, but now don't misuse that liberty. That means Jesus is saying, I have paid the price, I've bought you. Now you're free from sin. And you come, you ask for forgiveness, I will forgive you. Now don't misuse that freedom. Don't say, now remember, he's talking to the Galatian church. What was the problem in the church in Galatians? They were all believers, but they're going and getting circumcised. So I'll get circumcised, but I'm a believer in Jesus. So Paul is saying, how, you, how can you do that? How can you get be a believer? If you're a believer, how can you go back and be circumcised? That means you're working on the flesh there. So Paul is saying here, you, we, we must learn to walk in the freedom that God has given us. Right? To walk in freedom is also to walk with wisdom. Right? So for example, you have... You know, example, one day, you have three hours free, no classes. Okay? okay. Do what you want. Three hours. What are you going to do? Don't. What's the word? Misuse your? Now, nobody's going to check on you. Who's going to say what you did for three years? Right? Now, this is just an example, right? But it's your freedom. It's given to you. Right? You have the choice, right? And the same way here, the New Testament teaches us to use the freedom that God has given us with wisdom, right? To walk wisely. Do not abuse your freedom. And the New Testament also teaches us to walk in the spirit and to walk in love. Now, just because I have the freedom God has given me, I can't go around telling people, hey, you are wrong. The one you, you know, the God you worship is wrong. You are, you are doing this wrong. And, you know, the attitude of, you know, I am greater than anyone else or I am holier than anyone else. I cannot do that. But we're learning in lifestyle evangelism, right? Even as we minister to people, we minister in love, the spirit of love, right? To walk in love. The, the, the walking in love towards others overrides our walking in freedom. You know, the word overrides means God has given us freedom, but walking in love is more important than walking in freedom. Imagine we're walking in freedom, but you still we are still in hatred. We hate people. We look at people in anger and jealousy and pride. What's the use? God is saying you're free, you're walking in freedom, but I have all of this inside. But rather, walking in love is greater than walking in freedom. Everyone with me? So we see that walking in honor towards others overrides our walking in freedom. When we our freedom ends where honor towards others begin. You know, for example, you know, somebody has done something wrong to you. 
and you feel, hey, he should say sorry first, or she should say sorry first. Here comes the place. Now you have the freedom to forgive or not to forgive. Christ has given you the freedom, right? But what are you going to do about it? So when we place honor on others, we are giving up certain rights that we may have. Which is greater? Paul is saying here, to walk in honor is greater to walk in freedom. Then, to walk in a place of well-being of others is greater than walking in the freedom that God has given us. If my freedom is causing others hurt and pain and uh, and you know neglect and uh, you know just a place of emotional uh, un, uh, you know un, uh, emotional pain and neglect, then what does it mean? It means something's wrong. I I am misusing my freedom, so I have to come to a place of saying I'm willing to give up so that this person is feels better or I'm able to make him or her feel better. Willingly, we are completely free in our spirit, so letting go of liberties, what we could otherwise enjoy for the benefit of another person, willingly sacrificing our personal freedom for the benefit of another person. Because in our spirits, we are indeed free in Christ. Right? So think of it this way. God has called us to freedom. We are walking in freedom. The moment we misuse that freedom, it becomes a bondage. Or, it, uh, or I would say it becomes a place where the enemy can work. So always ensure, OK, I'm walking in freedom. If there are things that I have to do for others, or uh, there are things that I have to do in my life itself to help others, let me do it, because that is more important than the freedom that God has given me. Everyone understood? Right? OK. Obey civil authority. So Paul is writing. He's saying he gives a whole list there in Romans 13, 1 through 7. Uh, let's just pick up a few verses here. Verse 3 onwards, or verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Verse 5, therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but because, but also for your conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now look at this. Can you believe this? This is Apostle Paul writing to the Romans. The Romans are in control of the Jews at that time. Paul is saying, subject to authority. Now imagine the believers or the Jews reading this. Why should I subject to them? They are not good. They are. They have come, they have caused so much trouble, and we have to pay taxes to them. We are struggling, we are working hard, and we have to give them. So there was the Romans and the Jews, there was so much of hatred. But Paul is telling them, if you are a believer, right, you do what is right. And what is right is to, to make sure that we honor our authority. Honor the authority, for God, for he is God's minister, uh, and uh, you must be subject to those who are above you. If you have to pay taxes, pay it. If you have to pay customs, pay it. Notice Paul doesn't say, these Romans are not good. No, they are uh, taking all our taxes, so from now, let us not pay taxes. Or from now, 
we will uh, we will try our best and we'll ensure that the roman government does not uh, overpower us he doesn't say anything about it he's saying right now this is the authority we have to obey the authority right if they say pay taxes you got to pay the taxes if they say uh, you know 8 pm you can't go out of the house you have to obey it because right now they are in control they are our authority i see a question here uh, gertrude says what if the authority is evil see uh, so that's a good question gertrude uh, when you look at governments right, there will be evil right now let me give you the best example if the government is you know the, uh, say for example there is a couple of leaders who are evil right they have evil intentions they say okay from now we will increase the education in india by 20 percent so education is going to increase now what will the poor people do now it's not a right thing to do actually what should the government be doing providing free education right actually right poor people let's provide some free education uh, pro start some new schools, provide education. Let's get people to uh, children to learn, and let's make our country a better place by providing free education. That should be the mindset. But now, if you have some leaders saying, uh, you "Now we'll make it twenty percent more," and an intention to earn more money, you know that's evil. But even though it's evil, we'll have to obey it. If we want our children to join school, we have to, we can't say cut that 20%. It's a law. It's, 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 it's established. We have to pay. Now, like this, we'll have to obey these kind of rules. Now, say a government comes and says, you cannot share the gospel of Jesus Christ or you cannot have Sunday services. Right? You, uh, you cannot share the gospel. Now, which is more important? Human law or God's law? So authority is there. We honor authority. But when we honor authority, we must also know that we should not go against what God is telling us. Right? What did Jesus himself say? Go and pay the taxes. When they tried to uh, you know, catch him, he said, whose face do you see? If it's my face, you give it to me. He says, you see, whose face do you see? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. So Jesus himself didn't say, don't pay taxes. Was the Roman government evil? Yeah. Did he know that they are going to persecute and kill him? Yes. But he said, pay the taxes. Because we are under them. As a son of God, as the Messiah, he didn't say, I'm the one who created money. I'm the creator of this world. You're asking me to give you money. He didn't say that. So, so, give it. It's theirs. I, I'm sure the disciples would have thought, why should we give? No, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You tell them, no. Jesus didn't say all that. He said, give. As long as we are here, we should give. There will come a time the Roman government will go. Then it's ours. You understand? Right? There are certain guidelines that we must follow. Whether it is according to i mean whether it is beneficial or not beneficial we'll have to follow right but if it is but if there are rules and regulations set by the authority that are going against the word of god then you can always stand by god's word then you know okay god's word is more important than this okay Gertrude, i hope i answered your question Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Most welcome. Lucy has a question. This is with regard to a ritual we practice during marriages uh, of haldi ceremony and showering of rice grains. Any guidance on this to avoid in our get together in marriages? Okay. So, Lucy, I think this whole thing of uh, haldi and uh, rice. See, we need to understand in our nation, especially, what is a Hindu nation, right? And uh, there are many customs that have come in right now putting haldi or throwing rice right it could be 
a, 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 a practice that has done hundreds and thousands of hundreds of years ago and it's come down through generations right and right now people are still doing it but Lucy the question we must ask ourselves is when we do this are we glorifying anybody any other God right? so for example there's a strong believer a strong believer and he's gonna get married now and these two they say, hey, we have this uh, Haldi ceremony. Okay, so, so what is happening now? Is, is, it, is it that this person is going to uh, involve in something that is completely sinful? It's just a culture. It's something that they do. As pastors, we have gone for these ceremonies. We pray, we say, okay, God bless the couple. Bless them, bless their future. What is that thing they're putting? That's just some, it's a culture, it's a tradition. But it's not taking them away from God. You get what I'm saying, right? So we have prayer, we read the Bible, we have a message, sermon, we sing, we sing a couple of songs, we bless the couple, then they put, uh, you know, Haldi and all of it. Nothing's going to change. Right? Because they're believers. So what I would say is, Lucy, it's just a cultural thing right now for example you go to uh, you know you go to other countries they may not have this culture right they may have cultures which are different right now for example there are few marriages uh, you know even in our in our city and even in our nation we have you know where there is alcohol right there's a lot of alcohol and people drink and now you know that is wrong so you just avoid it and you avoid it as much as you can you avoid it but things like this, haldi and growing rice, it's not going to affect your spiritual life. Right? Now, if there's alcohol in a wedding, and and if we get involved in it, we know that, hey, I'm the body of Christ. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I can't involve in that, so I want to stay away from it. But it's a culture. Past 100 years, people are doing that. But I don't want to involve in that because it's affecting my spiritual life. Putting haldi and uh, throwing rice is not affecting my spiritual life. Right? Lucy, I hope that answers. OK. Yeah. OK. Honor your employers and managers. So Paul is writing again. Bond servants, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service. Everyone says eye service. Ah, eye service means hey, if somebody's looking, then you work. That person's gone now, then we looking everywhere. If somebody's looking, oh, thank you, Jesus. Nobody's looking. Uh, what time this is getting over? It's it's not going to be a big deal, right? What does it say here? Not with eye serve services as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So Paul is saying, you are bond servants, meaning you have a master. Be obedient to that master with fear and trembling. He may be a good person, good master. He may be a bad master, but you've got to be obedient. And be obedient not just with eye service, but also, uh, and not as men pleasers, but doing everything from your heart. This master is a hard task master, but still I will do everything from my heart because when I'm doing it, I'm doing it to please God. I'm doing it to honor God. God told me to obey, to honor, so I will do that. Amen? Right? So it's very important that we understand this. Verse 7, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Whatever good you do, you will receive from the Lord. That means God is your rewarder. So we are not working for, we may be working under a, a master or a boss, but our true reward comes from god the father god is the one who will open doors god is the one who will lift you up 
can you ever think about let's look at these two examples Moses he didn't made a mistake he killed the Egyptian he ran and now he's looking after his father's sheep father-in-law sheep right now I'm sure he would have said oh what am I doing learned in the palace I'm a great man now I'm looking after sheep this is not what I'm called for but I'm sure he did it faithfully would have done it faithfully meager task think hey I have to do it I've been asked to do this I will do it so later on we see that God honored him look at Joseph God you said my brothers you know you will make me a leader and my brothers will bow down before me where I am sitting in a prison but in prison also he was faithful you know uh, the Bible says that even in the prison he was prosperous God was with him that in a moment he became the second in command in Egypt how long that would have that whole conversation five minutes from prison to second in command five minutes so remember that your reward comes from who God. we may be working under people but God is our reward right so use your wisdom or use your freedom wisely your freedom ends where the well-being of others begin you and I are completely free in the spirit so we sometimes have to let go of liberties that God has for us uh, for the benefit of others look at this Romans 14 verse 1 says receive one who is weak in the faith but do not but not to disputes over doubtful things for one believes he may eat all things but he who is weak eats only vegetables let him who eats despise let not him who eats despise him who does not eat and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats for God has received him who are you to judge another servant to his own master he stands or falls indeed he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand look at verse 5 one person esteems one day above another another esteems every day alike let each one be convinced in his own mind he who observes the day observes it to the Lord and he who does not observe the day to the Lord he does not observe it he who eats eats to the Lord for he gives God thanks and he who does not eat to the Lord he does he, he does not eat and give God gives God thanks verse 7 for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself for if we live we live to the Lord okay say this after me if we live if we live we live to the Lord and if we die we die to the Lord so it's a basic simple instruction that Paul is giving see there are some people who eat he started this entire portion he's saying there are some people who eat meat there are some people who only eat vegetables there are some people who will not eat vegetables there are some people who only eat meat now Paul is saying those who eat meat don't look down on those who are eating vegetables hey what are you why are you eating vegetables don't do that and those who are eating vegetables don't look at the, those who are eating meat and say hey how can you do this you are not a good person or judge them so basically Paul is saying when you're eating whether it is meat or vegetables you're eating it unto the Lord he says that give thanks to God for the food and eat it don't judge each other don't rebuke each other and let it not be something that divides each other Paul is saying food is unto the Lord then he goes on and he says there are some people who say hey Sunday is the most important day they may fast on Sundays good because he's doing it unto the Lord but there are some people who say hey Sunday is my day to enjoy myself after church I would like to 
you know, have a good meal and get some good rest and get ready for the next day. Uh, those who are struggling and fasting, don't look about, look at those who are enjoying on Sunday and say, hey, you're doing something wrong. You get what I'm saying? Whether we eat, whether we observe different days, we do it unto the Lord. Right? For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Verse 9, for this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So all of these earthly things, these earthly traditions and customs should not divide us as believers. It is sad to see that, you know, even now across, we see that because of traditions and customs, sometimes in the church there is divisions. There are divisions within the church. But the, but the, the scriptures are so clear. Whether people observe or don't observe, whether we eat, we don't eat, all of it we do it unto the Lord. Because Christ, is the Lord Jesus, is God of both those who are living and those of the dead. Whether we eat, you know, whether it's Good Friday, for example, if it's Good Friday, whether we eat non veg or don't eat non veg it doesn't matter. What matters is our heart. Right? You remember growing up? I remember growing up, my parents said, Good Friday, don't eat anything. Don't eat non veg You go fasting. It was good intentions. But I realized that, hey, I'm just starving more than fasting. So I said, no, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. I would eat. But later I realized that it is of the heart. If God, you know, it is my relationship with God. I just remember that, hey, God died on the cross for me. The Lord Jesus paid the price. And so as a, as a day of remembrance, I want to honor him by doing this. I fasted. Some other people may honor God by spending time in, you know, two, three hours of worship. Or some other people may honor God by having a fellowship meal. So it's, it's not, it, these traditions must not divide us. You get what I'm saying, right? You know, now, it's very hard, you know, when traditions are there, it's very hard when we change it, right? When we do something the opposite, people will question, why did you do like this? Past 100 years, we are doing this. How can you change it? Maybe hard, but remember, Paul is saying here, Whatever we do, we do it unto the Lord. We're not doing it unto people. We're not doing it unto the church. We're not doing it unto our leaders. We're doing it unto the Lord. Right? So, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more. And to the Jews, I became a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the sake of the gospel. So Paul is just saying, we'll quickly close. Paul is saying, for the Jew, I will become a Jew. For the Greeks, for the Gentiles, I'll become a Gentile. For those under the law, I'll become under the law. Okay? So whatever it is, for the weak, I'll become weak. For the strong, I'll become strong. All of this I do for the sake of the gospel. Right? So we'll stop here and we'll pick up from chapter 79. Uh, that is section 9, children and joint heirs with Christ. Thank you. Have a good day. God bless.